You know what I want. Hello and welcome to the Raptors Weekly Podcast. I'm your Samson Folk. And today, a very special guest, somebody who we make time for whenever available, somebody who is in a new position, Blake Murphy, no longer beat writer for The Athletic, but co-host of the Fan Morning Show on Sportsnet 590. That's Monday to Friday, 6 to 10 a.m. Not a face for radio, but very good over there. Blake, how you doing, man? I'm all right. I feel like uh, the hours have made my face progressively better suited to radio <laughs> over the first couple of weeks. Well, hey, you know, that's that's part of the whole gig, I think, is you you become what you do. You know what I mean? Yeah, you don't really uh, you don't really have a choice. Those there's not a lot of flexibility in your in lifestyle when uh, it's six to 10 a.m. And I actually just before I came on here, I finally got approved to do at home COVID tests. So that'll save me like 15 or 20 minutes in the morning. So I have to get tested before I can go into the studio every day. Um, I'm double vaxxed, but you still have to get tested to go in. And now I have like a little at home kit and an app that I can use. So woohoo. I can wake up at 445 instead of 430 now. Look out. Hell yeah. Is there is there anything you've come to appreciate about the morning since you started waking up much earlier? Um, not necessarily. It's it's like a kind of a weird time of year where like it's uh I'm not getting sunrises yet because like there's no windows in the studio. So I feel like in the summer it'll be awesome because I'll be it'll be like 5 30 and I'm walking to work and like the sun's starting to come out and you get that nice kind of the the morning version of the golden hour. Um, but right now it's just like it's pitch black when I walk to work and it's <laughs> um I don't live in like I mean I live in a fine spot, but like you're it's not the the best neighborhood in the city um in terms of like yeah I'm a, I'm a large male i'm fine yeah i would worry about someone else maybe walking at that time of night at uh, uh if they weren't a large male you know you don't you don't fit the ideal demographic for an attacker they, they see the beard yeah and i don't even muscles. think it's like i don't even think it's it's that it's just a comfort level or whatever but it's uh it's fine i'm sounding very insensitive right now but <laughs> <laughs> okay let's talk about somebody who's not insensitive okay uh nick nurse leading the Raptors forward with all these different buttons. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would start this <laughs> off as, with the transition of Nick Nurse is not insensitive. Uh, he's Malachi Flynn's in the doghouse. Yeah. Chris Boucher's getting called out. I I thought I thought we would do uh, two on the nose as far as critiques go. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, anyway, that's that is kind of what I want to talk about mostly is the the shape of these first three games that have been played Washington, Boston, and just last night against Dallas, wherein Scotty Barnes has been fantastic. But Nurse even said that he wanted more from him. And yes, said that he wants more from Chris Boucher and Malachi Flynn, obviously not seeing the floor. But in those three games, is there anything that stood out as far as decision making? Are there lineups that you like? Were there, you know, packages of plays that you enjoyed a lot? Yeah, so, I mean, the first thing is I, I was glad they swapped Gary Trent in and, and Goran Dragic out. Um, from the starting lineup. I think Trent is a more natural fit uh, when he's kind of boxed into a, a lower usage role there. And not that he shouldn't have the freedom to expand his game a little bit. I think you want to give him chances to do that. But freelancing second unit, Gary Trent is not there yet. Um, and that lineup just like it desperately needs spacing because right now, unless you're getting Fred off the ball, there's not really a lot of of shooting threat. And even though OG is like an established three point shooter, they're trying to put the ball in his hands more. So um, I like that swap. I think eventually it'll probably make sense to swap out precious and chem. Um, I know precious has been pretty good so far, averaging a double, double showing some of the stuff that, that we were hoping he would show. Um, but I'm thinking more ahead to once Pascal Siakam's back, Ken Birch as a lower usage guy who does the kind of floor raising things. Uh, a little better, whereas Achua is more of a ceiling guy. I think that'll just make more sense for stability in the first unit. And then, you know, similar to almost the opposite, actually, of the Gary Trent thing is like, I, I would like for Precious to continue to get opportunities to expand his game a little bit and try a little bit more. And I think him and Boucher as kind of this chaos engine second group um, makes a little more sense than Boucher and Birch together. 
um, just like in terms of the second unit finding an identity. So we'll see how those goes. Boucher's not playing a lot yet anyway. So, um, and then I guess the other thing is like, like obviously Drogic is going to play because they want to keep him engaged and you want to make sure he has trade value and stuff like that. Uh, Malachi Flynn only playing three minutes so far is, uh, is alarming. And that's not necessarily just related to Drogic. Svi Mikhailuk's played 49 minutes total and has not been good coming off of a, a strong preseason. So um, there are minutes there to compete for. He's obviously behind Delano Banton right now. Um, but I would imagine Flynn factors in some point soon because the second unit guy, like it just, the depth has not contributed yet really. And well, why, why not try something different? You're supposed to be a depth team. And I know Pascal and Utah are, are on their way back, but I'd try to find some, some window for Flynn this next little bit. What do you think of the idea that the Raptor style kind of mitigates what Malachi Flynn is good at and enhances what guys like Delano Banton, Precious, and Scotty Barnes are good at? Because I, I believe the Raptors are first in transition frequency around 22 23% in the league. Yeah, and this is something you know we could have seen coming probably. And I, and I did talk about it a little bit in the preseason when, when Banton was ahead of um, Flynn then. And it, it's, it's tough because like, obviously there is that, that identity that they want to maintain overall, but in the second unit or those hybrid groups, particularly where, you know, they want to be chaotic. They want to get out and run. They want to force a lot of turnovers and they're willing to take risks around that. So Malachi Flynn does not fit that supernaturally because he's a more methodical feel based play between the tempos kind of guy. And the Raptors have minimized, you know, the pick and roll usage, which is Malachi Flynn was the best pick and roll guard in college. Uh, and it, it, let's, let's be honest, this is the NBA. There's going to be ample opportunity to use the pick and roll, even if it's not like the key play type you're running through. So I do think there's a little bit of skill and style misalignment there with, with Flynn and how the second unit is going to play. But, you know, I think you've got to give him some opportunity to, to try that and see if he can find himself where, you know, I, I, I don't know. He's just, he's young still and he's, he was solid last year and I believe in the defense and the three point shot. So you got to find a, you got to find some windows for him to get a crack at it. And like Delano has been cool, but, I want Delano down with 905. Like if, if we're talking about what's going to get Delano to the best version of Delano in time, it's heading down there and, and being with the 905 um, for a good chunk of the season. So, And inside the margins, not outside the margins, when we think about the, the main factors on this team, the OG, Fred, Scotty, those types of guys, what have you thought about them in this it's not a completely novel play style. We've seen teams do this for short spurts of times like that. But what have you thought about the main players uh, operating in this new style? Yeah, um, you know, I think the big one so far is OG's having a little bit of trouble with it. Um, 16 points a game is great, but he's shooting really poorly across the floor. And I, I don't think, you know, he was awesome in the preseason and he's shown real flashes of being able to create for himself um, over the last two seasons. I think right now he's maybe having a little bit of trouble with, what is good process and what is bad process. And, um, you know, he's, he's been a little streaky in terms of confidence level. And I think that's normal. Like this is a guy who's never averaged even, you know, league average uh, usage volume before. And now he's carrying like maybe not a one a usage level, but like a one B or high number two usage level being asked to take up 25% of the possession. So um, it's natural that there's an adjustment there and a discomfort um, but he's obviously, you know, the percentages speak for themselves. He hasn't been super effective in that regard. Uh, I think definitely it's suited Precious and Scotty. Um, I think Precious, you know, this is, it's one of those things where with a young player, I would rather have a guy who's doing a lot and trying to do a lot and you have to rein in a little bit over time. I would much rather have that prospect type than a guy who just doesn't do a lot and you've got to kind of coax stuff out of him. So the fact that Precious is willing to run off of every defensive rebound, shoot every offensive rebound, pull up from the mid range or whatever. Like, I think those are good indicators about how confident he is and, and where his opportunities for skill growth are going to come. Um, right now he's a bit of a black hole. Uh, so that's going to be, 
you know, part of part of the idea with this chaotic run and feel setup is going to be that everyone on the floor is supposed to be a good passer uh, because that's how that's how you put together the this kind of synergy of like, oh, the offense creates the offense and, and like we don't have to rely on any one guy. And right now, Fred's the only guy passing well in the starting unit. So um, it's suited Precious. But, yeah, they're going to have to rein him in a little bit or at least, uh, you know, if he moves the second unit, it's probably not a big deal that he's taking 10 shots a game while maybe passing two or three times a game. Um, and then Scotty, like, obviously, as a scorer, he's been better than any of us could have anticipated, averaging 18 and 10, um, just a monster on the offensive glass already, and pretty – pretty terrifying in transition. And, and I've thought his playmaking in transition has been um, pretty fun in the half court. The playmaking is not quite there yet. And that's something we warned about heading in that that's going to take a little bit more time and the speed and the length than the, you know, teams being ready for you is going to make that a little harder. And Nick nurse even said after Saturday's game that they need him to be a little bit more aggressive to kind of unlock some of his passing opportunities. So, um, you know, whether that's posting up, whether that's driving to pass instead of driving to, to score right now, like I, I actually think his pull-up game is a little, um, a little more advanced than I anticipated at this point. And I don't think like his handle's still not great or anything, but I think that having that as a counter option is nice and should open up some passing and stuff. Um, but mostly like, to, to get back to your core question, this is a setup and this is a philosophy for right now, at least until Siakam gets back, where everyone's kind of going to be given a chance to do more than they otherwise would. And the idea is to see what sticks and who runs with it. And, and you know, is OG ready for these five things or do we need to scale back to three or four? Is Precious ready for these three things or should we keep it to two core things. Um, and I think that's what these next couple of weeks before Siakam returns in mid-November are about. So you're going to have to live with some of these lumps. And I think to the credit of most of the players that we just talked about, and Gary Trent might be the best example of this, where um, you can't complain about the, the defense on the other side. Like guys are going to make mistakes offensively and guys are really trying to figure out who they are and what they can do offensively and we knew that the half court would be a slog this year but the defense has been really really good um and this is a team that they've they have no one over six nine and they've been a league average defensive rebounding team they've cut the foul rate dramatically from last year despite still forcing as many turnovers and then the opponent you know shooting percentages like maybe those will regress closer to league average or whatever because you're probably getting some some positive variance right now, the way it looks, but also that's a, uh, it's a pretty good base for your defense. Like, yeah, opponents aren't going to shoot 29% on threes all year, but the Raptors probably aren't going to shoot 26% on threes themselves all year. So, um, you know, that works both ways. So I, I'm, that's kind of where I'm at with these guys is the, this is what I expected the offensive side to be like, and the defense is maybe a little ahead of schedule uh, in my eyes. Is there anything in particular that you notice is more potent from the defense? Like, for example, if if there's a six foot nine guy tagging the roll man, uh, passes for the short roll and that kind of stuff are much, much harder. Or like a six nine guy guarding at the nail. Like Jason Tatum is one of the best nail defenders in the league, and his length obviously helps a lot. Is there anything that you're noticing as far as that goes? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely something to that, and I think the Raptors have always liked to use their length aggressively to, um, to pinch and to double and, and scramble back and stuff like that. And I think, you know, maybe so far they've done a little bit of a better job with those like later rotations of, okay, we collapsed and then helped here and who's got the weak side close it out. I think maybe they've done a little bit better with that than, than we saw in past years, but also that's, it, you know, we're talking a small sample for that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, mostly it's it's playing to their identity, right? I, I think they've always been a team under Nick Nurse that forced a ton of turnovers, and that's a length and aggression thing. Um, if anything stood out to me about the defensive rebounding, or, or sorry, about the defense, it's the defensive rebounding and that they've actually, they've found a way so far, and maybe their opponents just like aren't the best example of teams that are going to take advantage of this. 
Um, but they've grabbed 79% of their defense rebounds. And generally there's a trade-off between how aggressive can you be on the ball and in lanes or playing zone versus defensive rebounding. And there's a trade-off between how much can you really risk getting out in transition and leaking out versus defensive rebounding, because you need guys back near the paint to grab rebounds. And both of those kind of core tenets of their philosophy, freedom to gamble and freedom to get out and run, leave you a little further from the paint. And right now they've done a really, really good job. That's probably the thing about their defense. I expect to regress. Like I'm most confident won't stay this good, but also is like a, a huge step forward for them. Like I like on paper, this should be one of the worst defensive rebounding teams in basketball and them managing to, even if they can insulate themselves from that weakness a little bit and be like 20th in defensive rebounding rate. I think that lets a lot of the other stuff play up. So this isn't really a, a tactical answer to a tactical question, but I think it, it is a big part of why they've been so effective defensively. And, and like, if you look at their kind of four factors from the last couple of years, it's been the one that stands out as like, Oh yeah, this is the, this is the cost to doing the things you do well is you're going to be weak here. And they've managed to avoid that so far. Mm -hmm. I I also think that the three games they've played so far have been pretty good matchups for what their defense wants to do. Uh, Boston Mm -hmm. and Dallas in particular, because with Dallas, you could see before Luca went into takeover time and Luca had, he was, he was a little disrupted. Yeah. He had an awesome game and like the Raptors had an excellent defensive game plan. One that kind of hinged on putting the ball into Kristaps Porzingis' hands in the mid post against anybody like Gary Trent Jr., Fred Van Vliet. He didn't drive on either of them. He's fading away or he's passing out. And that allows their kind of strange uh, Swiss Army knife defense to get more aggressive in other places, force turnovers and stuff like that. And then with the, the Celtics, they, their big man presence isn't as, uh, I guess, dominant as a lot of other teams. And Jalen Brown, when he's when they're able to mitigate what a lot of what he's good at, and it just be, comes down to like Jason Tatum's shot making, that that was wholly effective. So I'm really excited to see against a bunch of other types of teams because the the Wizards pick and roll game with Spencer Dinwiddie, Bradley Beal, and Gafford in particular was really really effective, especially with Kuzma flying off ball. So I was yeah, I, I've been very excited to see the defensive applications game over game. And through three, it's been awesome. But uh, I think I want to get into the, not granular, but we can dive into more so player by player. And OG Ananobi, I think, should be the first guy we focus on. And each game, I think, has been one note in some regard. First game against the Wizards, a guy who's clearly trying to assert his pull-up. And game two against the Celtics, a guy who's trying to get to the rim. Game three, he was playing closer to a role that we've seen from him prior, that tertiary type of scoring role where he's getting points off of cuts. He's seeing spot up triples mixed into that was that fantastic drive on Luca that he got the dunk. And then also a, a pull up going to his right from the mid range against the drop. Hell yeah. Like good stuff. OG, but missing in all of that is a passing verb creation for other teammates. And so what have you thought about his mix of all the things he's trying to do currently? And then obviously underperforming his shooting talent to smidge. Yeah, like the, the underperforming shooting talent is, is always a big one. It's like, it's basically Siakam's entire last season where it was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he actually got better at every area of the court. Um, but he his three-point shooting dropped and that dropped his overall efficiency. And I was about to bring up OG's play types and realize I no longer have synergy access. Oops. <laughs> uh, don't change. Uh, don't change employers right before the basketball season. Um, But no, OG's been, you know, you teed it up well, right? Like he's, he's taking almost eight threes a game and those are going to drop a little bit more. And he does have pretty solid um, mechanics on his pull up, but right now he's a little in love with the step back and, you know, maybe it's tough because like the Raptors offense really can't afford to stick him in the corner a ton right now but that's where he's going to be a deadly shooter. So, um, you know, it's the same with Siakam's three point percentage dropped when they stopped using him in the corners, because then you're looking at it above the break threes and a lot more off one dribble two dribble. Um, and then inside the arc, you know, OG, he's, uh, 
he's a big, strong guy. And <laughs> I think within that, there's a little bit of you got to figure out when to use that strength and when it's going to get you in trouble a little bit to, to over rely on it. And that's really all. I mean, he he's he's good at creating space for himself. He's actually gotten away with, I thought, a, a couple like Tatum got him with a push off a couple times. And then OG like came back down the floor and pushed right back off of Tatum. And it was like almost like, a, OK, if you're not calling this, I'm going to try it, too. But like OG doesn't have Tatum's push off game yet. Uh, so I think it's honestly, I, there's not a lot of like process stuff I'm that worried about with OG. Cause I think naturally the usage will find it's kind of equilibrium point and they'll rein in like, okay, this isn't in your bag yet. You know, you're maybe allowed to do this when you're hot, but this shouldn't be your first go-to. Um, you know, he's, a he can be a wrecking ball driving to the rim. So that's what I want to see most from him right now. And I think he does have pretty good instincts for dump offs and finding cutters and stuff like that. He doesn't have, you know, he's not going to thread a pocket pass or, or like collapse a defense and make a wicked kick out just yet. Like maybe it happens once in a while, but that's not his core playmaking game. So I, I would like to see him focus a little bit more on um, using those opportunities where he has the ball in his hands to put pressure on the rim. Uh, the Raptors don't have a lot of that, especially in the half court. And I think with OG's strength, and his ability to kind of lock eyes with the rim and, and get there despite the handle not being an elite handle and stuff. Like we have a pretty good sample over the years of OG being able to bust that out once in a while. And I think that's where the focus as a self creator should be right now. Like the mid range stuff is cool. The footwork's great. It, it's awesome that if, if the threes and the rim stuff start hitting, you're going to need that mid range bag for sure. But it's like, he's not at the point right now where that should be option one or the thing he looks for first. So, um, you know, that's, I, I know this is some process criticism after I said, I'm not worried about a lot process wise, <laughs> but I think this is also like stuff he's going to figure out. Like he's three games into playing this role and uh, you know, he, he gets some time to kind of find the footing. Yeah. The most, probably the most encouraging thing to me about OG honestly is that, um, despite this heavier offensive role, like I thought he's been tremendous defensively through three games. And that's always the concern when a guy takes on more of this, both from a like energy and physicality standpoint, but also like a mentality standpoint of, you know, Oh, he's trying these like Kobe mid range shots and stuff. Like, is he still going to be the same guy defensively? And he's been the same guy defensively. I thought he's been tremendous on that end. So that's an encouraging point too, I think. Built different, truly. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as, yeah, putting the, the cart before the horse, if you're going to the mid-range stuff first. Uh, yes. This is just to see if we align on this, if you're seeing the same thing I do. I've noticed that quite often he is getting a step on his primary defender, but the Raptors in the front court currently are kind of low on spacing. I do find there's a lot of rotation towards him. And that's like the big thing, right, is a lot of the best primaries – know exactly what to do with that, whether it's like a counter, like we saw Luca do it last night, obviously, but yeah, whether it's going like a sidestep footer or manipulating his primary more so to get into two-on-one -on -one situations or one-on-one -on -one situations rather than one-on-two, there's been no manipulation from OG so far. Are there any lineups that you think would benefit him in that way? Yeah, and I think that's a good point on your part. And I think that's kind of like, a sequential step in, in growing into this role. And we went through it with Siakam and we went through it with DeRose and it's like, okay, can you create for yourself? And then it's, can you create for yourself and react to what the defense does? And he's still figuring out that phase. And then the third phase on top of that is, can you manipulate what you know a defense is going to do? And then you're, you're almost, you know, a step ahead then. And that's what only not everyone gets there, but that's like, that's like obviously the Luca thing and the Jokic thing is like, Oh yeah, I know I'm going to do this. And then you're going to do this. So I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this and you're not there yet. And OG is obviously, you know, he's three games into having the ball in his hands a lot. So <laughs> um, he's not anywhere close to that yet. And even Siakam's still figuring out, you know, I thought Siakam's playmaking growth last year was him getting kind of to the top of that second tier of, there's nothing you can, or not nothing, but there's not a ton you can throw at me that I won't be able to react to and figure out on the fly. And OG's kind of at the bottom of that tier right now where it's like, 
okay, this is the first time you all recognize that I can score on you. And now I'm figuring out how to react to the fact that I'm not catching you by surprise. Um, so I think the manipulating the defense is a, is a few steps away for him still. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tough one because he's always, I thought for a low usage guy had pretty good passing chops and good vision and good feel and stuff like that, especially, you know, him as a baseline cutter or, or the odd time he posts up and finds a guy like he has good instincts with that kind of stuff, but to marry those two skill sets of I'm a good playmaker as a tertiary and I'm now a primary, like those are, it's not the same type of passing. It's the same base kind of skill set and feel that you need, but you have to unlock that in a completely different way. Um, so I think, again, this is, we got to give them some time to, to kind of figure this stuff out. But in terms of lineups, you know, this is part of why I thought Gary Trent being with the starters made a little more sense than Drogic because, um, you know, Fred's obviously a very good three-point shooter, but he's going to have the ball in his hands a lot and you need a little bit more spacing. And then the Cam Precious flip, I don't know that there would be necessarily better spacing. Like Kem seems a little bit more comfortable in the corner, but Precious seems maybe a little bit more comfortable in the like long mid range area. Um, but I also think at this stage, like Kem's a better screener and Kem, I don't know. There's a little more like solidness there. Whereas I can't think of a specific example, but I can like picture in my head where like OG's, OG's driving or, or operates pick and roll. And then like, Precious rolls into his space because Precious his instinct is to roll to the rim after that. And um, and Precious is also like a big screen slipper. He doesn't he doesn't smack those all that often. Um, so I could see something like that. And then like Scotty's instinct off the ball is to like find a cutting lane. And then you've suddenly got three guys there. Um, and that hasn't happened a ton, but it's going to happen at, at some point. So um, and then I think, you know, looking way forward, Siakam being back will, will help because, you know, that's a when you have Siakam and an OBN Van Vliet in the same lineup, I think there actually will be opportunity for one of those guys to be in the corner. And all three of them would be good threats from the corner. Whereas when there's only two of them on the floor, they're probably operating above the break or with the ball in their hands. So I think the most uh, encouraging thing is that OG has shown each skill independently and then you're just looking for the mix of all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff which is tough and basically that's what pascal the the critiques of his game stem from people being frustrated with like process and that's basically what it is like the mix of the application how you're affecting the defense but i think with og trying to do it now and as we'll watch it happen throughout the year i think people will probably start to come around to the idea that wow siakam did a very impressive thing with his, the timeline of his career and his uh, progression and all that stuff. So that's, that's really interesting, but I think OG, yeah, the guy who didn't dribble over his two college <laughs> seasons is now getting reps as a primary. Yeah. It's uh, but yeah, I also think OG, like you talked about, you can't use him spacing in the corner, but he's also really good there. Some yeah. sets he will. And especially when Pascal comes back and I think there's like an all-star future for OG without being just a monstrous primary. Because as you talked about, it, the defense is tremendous. And OG is not only one of the better primary options on the Raptors right now, but he's also the best zone buster. He's one of the best rollers and maybe the best spot-up shooter outside of Fred. So it's a guy who needs to be used all over the court and can only be used in one place. And right now they're asking him to do what is the most uncomfortable thing for him. So as you, as you stressed a few times, like patience with OG is definitely. Yeah. And it's tough. Cause like, this isn't a year where like they have eyes on a playoff spot. It's not, you don't want to have infinite patience, but you know, if you're thinking bigger picture and you want to know what gets this team back to actual contender status down the line, you got to leave room for these guys. Like you can't, you can't operate as if every game is a must win and you're just maximizing what will win you that game. Like you got to give these guys space for this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scotty Barnes, the wonderful effervescent kid who got drafted out of Florida state university uh, murmurs that he's going to change the culture and turn the Raptors into this happy go lucky team. Uh, no longer the championship curmudgeonly Kyle Lowry Raptors, which is very fun in its own way, but the new, and uh, 
what would the term be? Yeah, effervescent seemed fine. Yeah. Uh, Scotty Barnes leading them into the fray. What have you thought about him so far? Because you did mention a pull-up game that was more advanced than you thought. And to be fair, then basically any draft guy who talked about him or any, you know, that kind of stuff. This wasn't something that was talked about. But uh, way more scoring punch than basically anybody had predicted. Uh, like very aggressive, gamble-heavy defense, of course. And a little less playmaking than people expected. But I don't think that's his fault currently. Yeah, so... Um, you know, a lot to unpack there. I think the big thing is, is of course the scoring, he's got 54 points through three games and he's shot above 50% from the, from the field. Um, it's pretty good for where he's at. Even, even like four free throw attempts a game is pretty good for where he's at right now. So you look at, you know, you break down where he's getting his shots from and the fact that he's shooting at all in the like 10 to three point range area is great. It's uh, it's not a ton of shots, but it's cool. It's uh, it's good that he's willing to try that stuff. And, and like, he's certainly not going to shoot 67% on long twos, um, you know, very often or, or at all, but uh, you know, it's good that he, he has a comfort level there. And, and I think, you know, he's finished at the rim really well. He's at 69% within three feet. And that's, you know, to be expected because that's a diet of, offensive rebounds and transition buckets. Um, but it's where probably the, the part of his scoring mix that I'm most impressed by so far is um, he's shooting 55% in kind of that like low mid range floater range. And I think for, you know, some of that is he's got the little hook shot. He's got a bit of a leaner um, when he's driving it and there's traffic there. And like, sure. You would love for him to just like pull through that and get to the rim, but that's not always realistic. So the fact that he has some touch from that range is encouraging to me. Um, you know, I think the the handle isn't there yet. So he's leaning a little bit on physicality and chaos. And um, that kind of one dribble jumper is, uh, it's going to be an important weapon because he doesn't have, like, the handle's not going to be there yet to drive on guys one-on-one. But he has, he's so big, and if that, you know, one dribble step in can be a weapon. Um, I think that's a, a pretty solid counter and, and you want him comfortable with that. Um, you know, I'd expect honestly the percentages to come down on that a little bit just because he's not, you know, mechanically, he's not like an awesome shooter yet still. Um, but I think that also leaves you, gives you encouragement that like, hey, this guy didn't have any pull up to him at all a couple months ago. And he's got some comfort level with that now. I think maybe that leaves you encouraged that the three point shot can get to at least like a passable show me thing. Uh, he's one of five so far. Um, and then, yeah, on the defensive end, the biggest thing that stood out to me is how Scotty Barnes just can't believe he's getting called for some of these fouls. <laughs> and it's like, like he's already got the superstar level. Uh, who me? <laughs> like how, me? What? And it's like, buddy, you are you know, big paws on a puppy here. You're running all over the place. You don't, you don't have quite the defensive coordination set yet. You're getting, you know, there are a couple of situations where you got rooked or you got caught like looking away or whatever, and you're trying to make up for that. And that's awesome. I'd much rather have the guy making the playmaking mistakes than being passive or over conservative or whatever, but you gotta, you're going to be foul prone with Scotty Barnes' style of play right now. And it's just, it just is what it is. Like, I don't think you want him to lose that. I'm going to try to make a play on every single thing. And if someone beats me, I'm going to make up for it. Like, I don't think you want to hammer that out of him just yet. Um, but he's going to have some nights where like, like last night, I know he had the the contusion and that's, he got some rest at the end of the second quarter, but he also had three fouls. And uh, we might see some situations where uh, he's got to sit down a beat because of foul trouble but it's uh you don't want him to lose that. So you, the only part of it you want him to lose is the like incredulous, like it's a very Raptors thing to just not believe the call didn't go your way every single time. It's, it's pretty funny to watch so far. Uh, when you see him like jump a screen and the player ends up rejecting the screen, you're like, Oh, cause he thinks he's guarding like a point guard from like Gardner Webb. Like his fourth yeah. game of the Florida State, he, like he's like, I'm gonna jump this screen and I'm gonna sidle this player back out to half court and just dominate them. 
And then the player ends up projecting the screen. You're like, ah, and then he's scrambling back and yes. maybe comes back over the top, stuff like that. But something and he doesn't have quite the like hip fluidity and stuff to, to go through multiple screens like that changing direction. Like he's still, he's great and uses his length and anticipation well, but he's like, like physically, he's a little bit stiff doing that stuff still. So I don't think, yeah, I don't, he's not going to catch up on that. The uh, the draft experts use the term high hips uh, ah. to refer to Scotty Barnes. Is that now, what it is? Yes. I wouldn't pretend to know anything about it, but that's the term they use. A, a super interesting thing, you talked about like his in-between game, 55% in that below free throw line above the charge circle, like that area. This is the whole deal with drafting high field players is you wonder – you see it apply in like, obviously his playmaking was the biggest thing. He was stamped as a playmaker coming out of Florida state university, but you wonder if that feel can apply to other parts of the game. And I've been so intrigued and encouraged by his one-on-one offense because he has an excellent feel for where his defender is in proximity to him. And this has gotten him like to the front of the rim to advantageous, like bank shots and all that kind of stuff. And the craft to be able to score one-on-one in those kind of get the ball in a pinch. You just, you flash into the lane and now he's going to kind of rummage around there and get a bucket. That's yeah. kind of awesome. Like, hell yeah, because that wasn't something. Yeah. And I then like, either. imagine when the skill catches up with the mm-hmm. field. Right. And this is like, I, this is one of my takeaways from summer league and it was, it's hard to verbalize this, but like at summer league, it felt like his brain was ahead of his body kind of where he was seeing opportunities to do stuff and trying to do them in really cool and encouraging ways. And like, you know, the handle's just not there yet. Or like, you don't have, you know, you took the wrong angle or you, you bowled over a guy or whatever, but I was very encouraged by like, Oh man, you saw that opportunity and we're like aggressive toward it. And like the skill stuff can catch up, right? Like it's, it's much easier. I think not that any player development stuff is easy, but I think it's easier to bring along skill than feel. Mm -hmm. So with him, you know, I think that stuff's, that stuff's pretty encouraging. Well, this is also something Lewis had talked about with Pascal. Something he used to do in pick and roll coverage was he'd cheat to the strong side, knowing that he could recover to the weak side. And this would make reads really, really intimidating for ball handlers. And it would make it very, very crowded for rollers who are either short rolling or trying to get all the way to the bucket. And Scotty Barnes, I've seen him cheating some plays in the proper context. And so, as you were saying earlier, like there are some playmaking defensive playmaking full pause he's making where he has to catch up. And when you're a big man, you operate in the vicinity of the basket. Rarely do you play one-on-one basketball like guards often do. Like you're not attached to a man chasing around screens or trying to get around screens. It's all about proximity to the basket and the dimensions of the floor change at a few different levels. So it's always going to be adjustment that way. And I've been pretty happy with just seeing how he's going to continue to adapt that way. And most importantly, uh, transition. Hell yeah, Scotty. His yeah. throw ahead pass, he has a step on everybody. It's very rare to see from a guy his size, but he gets the board and he throws it with his weak hand out and bursts into space. Just last game against Dallas, you could see he was managing two different defenders because he had one guy on his hip who he wasn't looking at. And then the player who was trying to come up on the strong side of him he knew where he was. And so he's managing two defenders while operating in a lane in transition and trying to open up lanes for other. This is stuff Kyle Lowry did in transition. And Scotty Barnes is managing lanes for his teammates. That's awesome to see, not to mention like the no look passes. It's not even like he looks at the guy and then looks the other way. And it's like, it's a no look pass. Now he doesn't look at the guy. He just has incredible awareness. So that's by far the most fun aspect of his game so far. It's just, he looks like he's going to be one of the best transition players for the next like 10 years. Yeah. And and you like, yeah, again, it goes to kind of like the, the skill and feel components where if he's already seeing that stuff and trying that stuff, like I think of like the handle and like, what if he, what if he gets competent dribbling in transition too now? Um, and not that he's like incompetent, but like he doesn't have like he, he doesn't have a lot of drill. He's just grabbing and going. Right. And it's like, OK, well, what if what if you unlock a little more where he's also, you know, if he gets a euro at some point. Then you think of what else he could create and, and like, 
I don't know. It's it's so fun. It, there's not there's really not a lot more to say than that. That mm-hmm. it's like the transition stuff is so fun right now. And I mean, that's the that's the stuff. This is my take from summer league as well with him was like, oh, yeah, the playmaking is way ahead in transition than it is in the half court. And, and that's that's a lot of like feel and pattern recognition. And like you just haven't had the ball in your hands in the half court a ton yet. Uh, but it's yeah, it's great. It's uh, it's very cool. And there's not like. I think ahead to, okay, if Siakam comes back and Scotty moves to the bench, which I don't think is a certainty, but let's mm-hmm. say it happens. And he gets to be kind of the leader of that chaotic second unit with Boucher and Achua and like one of the guards. It could be, it could be a lot of fun. It's a, uh, there's an identity to this team so far offensively that he really, really fits. I selfishly, I want to see both of those things. Like I want to see, him in the starting lineup, and then I want to see Staggers like with yeah, the minutes. So, so, that so he's out at the six worlds. minute mark, and then he's back in at the top of the second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think honestly, I with how well he's played, I think that's actually the likeliest outcome. Um, and then Trent moves to the bench, uh, and you've just got this monster, massive team. Um, and then I, yeah, I, you're you're I, gonna stagger those guys in some way anyway, so. I have this dream of Pascal in the low post and Scotty and OG occupying the weak side, Scotty above the break and makes like a 45 cut that collapses the weak side zone. And he's in the short roll area when he gets the pass from Pascal. And then, and then OG can either space out to three or duck into the dunker spot. And then you put Scotty in those two on one situations, just coming from that weak side. I'm just like, I think that would be beautiful basketball. Like we could see Scotty make a 45 cut into the middle of the court. And then we could see OG make a baseline cut for like a lob from Scotty. And I just like, there's, there's beautiful basketball potential. I see there that I would be like, hell yeah. I'd like to see all the machinations and interpretations that they could come up with, but certainly just getting him out in transition with like precious and guys like that would be, and Boucher would be super fun. Uh, we could probably move to Precious Boucher, the whole big man thing going on. You mentioned Cam probably serving as a better floor raising guy. I think I've noticed that as well. When I see Cam on the floor, I notice, and particularly with Precious, who is putting up stats, but is maybe operating too much on ball and is more willing for his own offense and his own looks than would benefit the starting five. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, early thoughts on the, the front court so far. Yeah, again, I think I'd probably swap Precious and Kem at some point. Um, Dallas wasn't the best example of that because I thought Precious was one of their better players in that game. Um, Mm -hmm. And Dallas has just, like, they've really struggled in this era of that team against front courts like Toronto's defensively. Um, So I thought that, like, the first quarter was a great example of how you want to play against the Mavs if you're the Raptors. Uh, And then everything dried up. But... Uh, in general, I think, yeah, I think we're looking at those two guys splitting the minutes at something resembling 50-50. And then if Boucher starts playing well, you know, maybe you go with Boucher at the five for five or six minutes where you find windows for it. Um, you know, I, I I do wonder if if Cam is just a floor guy and Precious has some up and down and Boucher, you know, until Siakam's back, Boucher's got a clear role as a forward off the bench. When Siakam's back, it's a little harder to find Boucher's minutes. I don't think he's going to be out of the rotation or anything. Um, Although if he keeps playing like this, maybe. (laughs) Um, But so where was I going with that? What I'm going to be most curious about with the center rotation is, does Precious come along fast enough? Does Cam do enough? And are they comfortable enough with Boucher at the five? for those three to hold it down 48 minutes a game or like, is Nick going to be tempted to go Siakam, OG Barnes, three, four, five in some order. Um, Because I think everyone wants to see that at some point and precious still fits that ethos and what you, how you'd want to play defensively, but like he's a step behind those guys defensively. So I'm curious if, if Nick gets tempted to do that eventually for right now, like it's not, I think they have three guys you'd be comfortable with as your backup center, and none of them are a starting caliber center. And that's that makes it a little hard to 
uh, manage the the position a little bit, but it's also not that bad. Like you always have a solid center on the court. You just don't have, you know, you're not going to start many games with an advantage at that position. So um, that's about how I feel about it. It's gone pretty much how I expect so far. Like, you know, them playing close to the same amount of minutes, Precious having more stats, but Kem probably having like a, a steadier impact. I think that's that's probably how it's going to play out. I, I vow to the listeners and people who read my work, this right here is the last time I will openly pine for Sean Holmes on the Raptors, but ooh, <laughs> God, would that be nice. And sorry, I should just say, even though I say Kem being a little more solid or whatever, like like by net rating and plus minus and stuff, Precious has much better numbers right now, but that's almost entirely like line mate dependent. He gets the swing minutes. He's, he's yeah. gotten them so far this well, year. Yeah, he gets the starter minutes, and then he's also gotten, like, he was on the floor for that Banton-led run. So, like, you're going to – we're talking about tiny, tiny samples for that kind of stuff yet. So, you got to go – you got to go qualitative for lineup stuff right now, I think. And I, I do think as far as – and as a guy who, you know, if the listeners have been listening to any of the podcasts I've done, I've come in a little lower on Kem than maybe the consensus – my eye test of him so far is I, I think he's actually been quite good relative. Yeah, to, I just I wish there was more to the passing. Like he just he sees those short roll and elbow opportunities just a little slow for the mm-hmm. Raptor system. And it lets like the whole thing is you can't let a defense catch up, right? And that's that's never been Kem's game. And I thought down the stretch last year it was like, oh, maybe he has that. Um, and also this is a guy who missed most of camp, so there's an element of that too. Um, but that, that's where I, I think that unlocks some stuff if, if he can get there. Um, but you know, not everyone's going to be a, a playmaker, you know, it, we, there's no Bielitsa on the roster currently yeah. to unlock yes. every funky short roll. Yes. Belly Jokic. Yes. <laughs> Greatest of all time. Yeah. Okay. Let's do a guard rotation, Fred, Gary, Svi. Uh, Dragic, and then obviously we'll have some Banton stuff because he's super fun. And even though we covered him a little bit on earlier, that's okay. But Fred, a a very strange mix so far, but he's in a super, super tough position. I think this team is not at all geared towards Fred's. This does not enhance his game. This is asking Fred, like, we know you're a really, really smart guy and you're a great player please try and make it work in this context. What have you thought about him doing that so far? Yeah, I think he, he's a tough one to evaluate because like you said, he's, he's the balls being rolled out there and they're basically being like Fred figured out, man, like, please help (laughs) us figure it out. And he's such a, like, I thought the first game he was over aggressive looking for his own shot. And he had those comments after the game of, well, if I play better, it calms us all down. And that's, probably true but also like what are you gonna do if you're friend like the <laughs> boston game i know they won the boston game and his minutes were really strong and he had nine assists but like you probably also can't afford fred van vliet only taking 10 shots right now like you play that game out a couple times and i don't know that the offense holds up as well with fred in like a pure distributor role um i'm not at all worried about the threes like it's Fred Van Vliet. He's not going to shoot twenty two percent on threes. Like I think the floor there is like thirty five or thirty six percent. Even if the diet of shots is really tough, um, you know there is no room in that current starting lineup for him to play off the ball. So I'd expect his three point percentage to be a little bit lower right now until Siakam comes back or if he gets more minutes with Dragic or whatever. Um, and he's you know we've talked about a lot over the years that he struggles to finish, and I don't know that that's something that's ever really going to come along like he's he's three for five at the rim but he's one of nine in that like floater area he is uh it's one less if you will when it comes to the the floater (laughs) range um and like it's not even a case of like oh there's some cool process side stuff it's just like he just hasn't been that good driving to the rim uh driving to the paint right now so that's tough he's had a tough couple games but i think there's a lot on his shoulders organization wise and mentally. And I thought as usual, the defense has been there. I thought as a passer, his Celtics game was really, really good. Um, But not dissimilar to OG. Like he's got to figure out this is the first time he has the ball in his hands more than anyone, right? Like 
he was co-point guard with Kyle and really co-co-point guard with Kyle and Siakam by the time last year came around. So this is new to him too. And it's not like throwing the ball to OG and getting off ball is not the same as throwing the ball to Kyle or Pascal and getting off ball. Like he can't expect his baskets to be created for him by anyone in this lineup. Um, so it's going to be, it's tough right now. Like I, I don't expect Fred to be hyper efficient over this like 12 or 15 game stretch without Siakam, because there's no, there is no path to easy baskets for Fred Van Vliet right now. Um, and I don't want to make, you know, like certainly if his true shooting percentage stays at 42.2%, we're going to have a real problem. We're going to have to talk about Fred. Uh, I don't expect it to be that low, but I also don't expect it to be crazy high because he has right now the hardest job in this offense. And if you're an opponent, like, yeah, you're game planning for OG and Scotty, but a lot of it is just like, okay, stop them. And then like, stop that action. And then things will dry up in the half court. So like you can focus on Fred. Um, so I expect more from him, but this is a difficult stretch for him. He's, I think he's playing the hardest minutes right now. Mm -hmm. There's two easy shots available to him on the floor at all times. And it's, relocating yeah and like a that's all relocation is an art form to itself and then yeah. the second one is above the break transition threes if scotty or precious whoever recognizes him there and that that's like something the raptors can do as a favor to themselves is not have fred push in transition and just try and you know become more efficient that way but yeah totally this i hope raptors fans are aware that these limitations for Fred aren't new and this doesn't take away from anything that he's good at. He is just, as you said, playing the hardest possible minutes for his skill set, his archetype, whatever. And there's just no structural help to what he's doing. It's, it's a slog out there for sure. Yeah. And even the relocation stuff, like, yeah, he's very good at it, but it also relocations require, like there has to be another guy who knows you're relocating and hits you as soon as you hit that three point line. Like I would bet if you look back over Fred's relocation stuff over the years, like a lot of it comes from Kyle passes probably because you need a guy who's a good passer and who knows your relocation stuff well um, to do that. It's like, I remember in the preseason I had in my notes a couple times that Malachi relocated really well after getting off the ball and no one found him. And it's like, Oh, you're a point guard who like has real shooting mechanics and not, not a good NBA sample, but a good like G League summer league preseason sample of three point shooting um, just flashed himself open for th for a wide open three. And, you know, you guys missed it. So um, in terms of guard rotation, we may as well stay on Flynn. I think at this point, like message received Nick Nurse, mm -hmm. but you are not a team that practices a ton. You're coming off a of back to back. You have another back to back on the weekend. There's not a lot of practice time here you got to give him a shot and you, he never really got like a big chance in the preseason. And I get it. Like if he's not playing to form and he's not playing the style that you want, you have to kind of be like, Hey man, like nothing's given here. We assumed you were going to take the second unit over, but you know, you got to earn that still. And Delano's outplayed you. Maybe I think for like, just logically, Malachi should end up as your best bench guard and you're going to have to give him an opportunity at some point. Delano has been a ton of fun, but I don't think even like the, the people who love Delano's brand of basketball the most think he's ready to run a second unit full time. And Drogic is probably best off right now as like a co-point guard that can maybe Malachi has got the ball in his hands, but Drogic can settle things down if need be. Um, and then Svi just hasn't, hasn't been good. Uh, despite the really strong preseason. So I, I don't know. I, I would like to see Malachi sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And like, sure, if he plays 12 minutes one game and he's bad and doesn't do the things that you are asking him to and have been hammering home, sure, then you put him back out of the rotation. But it's a sophomore who had a pretty solid rookie year and a pretty solid summer by all accounts. Uh, I would, uh, and you got three years invested in him still. I would uh, maybe give him a window here somewhere. Mm-hmm. Well, a few things you brought up there. If, yeah, as you were saying, people yeah, are I talk a, fan. a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's the job, apparently. Something 
to that effect. But as you as you're saying, people are a fan of Banton's game. Even if you look at Dallas, like that stretch of death against Dallas, like Banton was very involved in a lot of actions and to no avail. Right now, he occupies a very strange space in the NBA where he can completely come in and honestly, not all by himself, but can help affect change in play style that leads to like an 11-2 run. And I, this is something I was talking about with Lewis is like, I wonder what it's like to be Nick Nurse right now sitting on the bench like, uh, the rotation I'm about to put out, I'm going to trigger an 11-3 run, but I don't know which way it's going. <laughs> like, I just, I have no idea what's going to happen. And Banton, he's like a, you know, he's a black box right now. You don't know what's going to happen. And he's, he's looked great, by the way. He deserves a lot of love for how, yeah. he's, how he's done. But yeah, I'm more thinking like, if we're looking at the next, maybe not 82, but let's say the next 10 to 15 games. This mm-hmm. is a window for Banton to get some opportunity for sure. Cause the nine Oh five haven't started up yet and stuff, but November 11th is the nine Oh five season opener. Probably right around when Siakam gets back. I think you would like to know at that point, if Malachi Flink can give you rotation minutes. So Scotty Barnes can go to the nine Oh five where again, right now he can give you a couple fun minutes as maybe like your 10th, 11th guy. But if you're trying to turn Delano into a rotation player by next season, he needs that nine Oh five time. Mm -hmm. And also, like, here's the thing about Malachi Flynn. This is something I wrote about and something I started to notice is like when he doesn't have a pick and roll partner, basically everything he does becomes a high wire act. What he has to try and pull off on the court is very, very tough to do. Basically, they it seems more akin. There was a lot of people said that he was Fred Van Vliet when he got drafted. They call them Red Van Vliet. No similarities in their game. There's nothing. It's also like the Norm Powell, Gary Trent Jr. comparisons. Just stop. There's like nothing on the face of the game that makes sense. But Malachi Flynn is right now, how he's playing with the Raptors is closer to Jamal Crawford than it (laughs) is to Fred Van Vliet. Like they say, go use your dribble, get wiggly and make some shots. And when he makes shots, he plays a good game. But as you, you know, highlighted earlier, the relocation, all the stuff he's doing on the margins, just there isn't a reward for it. And so he's a a heady backup point guard who is now just a shot maker. And wow, what a position to be in at the NBA level. Like it's a good thing he's a, a positive defender or at least something close to that. So he, yeah, I'd like to see him play, of course, because he has real NBA skills. But in the context of the roster, I think they've really mitigated what he's good at. And yeah, just... Really tough start to an NBA career, especially for a guy who is, you know, a first round pick, albeit late first round. Yeah. And here's here's the other thing is if you're not going to play him and you do have Banton firmly ahead of him, you better give me Malachi Flynn 905 minutes. <laughs> I will. You got to give me some 905 point guard because David Johnson is not going to be <laughs> handling the ball full time, I don't think. And Brian and Tyree is working his way back from a, a torn ACL still. So that means Jawan Evans is your your 905 point guard. And and like I'm not saying this from a perspective of like just the watchability of the 905 and if they'll be good or not, but also we've seen over the years very much that a good point guard at that level is important for developing your guys because you need to have those guys in positions to succeed and um, not overextending themselves too quickly and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. Uh, Dragic and Gary Trent Jr. I want to hit on Gary Trent Jr. first. I think what an interesting season so far because his offensive punch from like that 58% true shooting season he had with Portland where he was guns a-blazing from uh, three-point land. I don't think like a good Gary Trent Jr. season again, I think he could get close to that true shooting percentage. I think he could provide a similar shot-making punch But right now, the shot making isn't there. He's a guy who isn't fantastic at creating his own shot on high efficiency and is a tertiary player. He's a, you know, he's not a three and D player, but he can shoot the hell out of the ball. The most impressive thing I've noticed so far is a little bit more punch defensively. And that's made his, the floor of his game has risen, I would say, considerably from where it was with the Raptors last year. And that's why you've been able to, or I've been able to, as probably somebody who's been a little bit harsh on Gary Trent, stomach his minutes even as he's shooting 33% from the floor and providing no playmaking pop. Yeah, through three games, eight steals, 13 deflections, five loose balls recovered. 
Mm-hmm. That is pretty good. Um, you know, that, that deflections number is uh, tied for sixth in the NBA so far. Fred's first, by the way. Um, <laughs> and then that loose ball recovered number is up there. The steals number is up there. Tiny samples and all that stuff. But Gary Trent, Gary Trent's defense was overrated when the Raptors acquired him. And people were like, oh, this is like, you know, I don't need to get into the specifics. But people were very, very much locked into Gary could be or is a good defender. And I think is, should have been, could be. Because he has a bit of the, like I thought his time in Portland, he had a bit of the, um, people think you're a good defender because you're doing a lot of stuff but you're not actually like impacting the opposing offense. Pat Bev uh, trick y'all, man. Yeah, you know? exactly. The, the old, what is it? That, that was about Beverly, right? Yeah. 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 I think, I think it's kind of like the, after the first couple of years of Avery Bradley's career, he's become that guy too. Where like, I remember Damar used to say that Avery Bradley was the toughest guy in the league to score on. It's like, Damar, you average like 35 points yeah. against him <laughs> really efficiently. It's like, you own this guy. What do you mean he's the hardest guy to, to, to score on? Um, but yeah, so I, I think that was a big talking point heading into this year. And, and like the three-point shooting that Gary is going to provide is always going to be with this roster in such high demand that like, he could be bad defensively and he's still going to get minutes. They don't have shooting and he's a really, really good shooter. Um, now he should stop one dribbling open threes, but that's another thing. Uh, but yeah, Gary Trent, like finding his way in this defensive environment where yes, you can gamble and yes, you can use your length and instincts. Um, but what comes with that is, you got to put your ass on the floor and you got to put your body into bodies and stuff. And I think maybe he was a little too much of a kind of finesse defender last year. And I think he's got a better understanding of the physicality that goes into playing that style of uh, aggressive defense. Um, Now, I don't think, you know, I'm not ready to be like, Oh, Gary Trent's going to be all defense or anything like that. It's a, it's a three game blip and a strong preseason defensively. Um, and if he shoots 33% on threes, the fan base is going to turn on him anyway. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's, I think it's really encouraging because you don't like, you look at potential closing lineups, the Raptors could have in close games if they ever play one. And you don't want a guy that can get picked on defensively, but you also can't play a lineup where Fred Van Vliet is the only guy who's a, a shooting threat at all. So, you know, one of Gary or Svi or Sam Decker is going to have to be on the floor late in games. And I think we all know who you would prefer from that group. So it's great. It's good to see, um, you know, 31 minutes might be a little high for him once thing, once Siakam's back and, and we see how the, the rotation shakes out behind that. But right now they really need his three-point shooting and he's answered the call defensively. I don't, uh, I don't think he leads the league in steals and deflections at the end of the year, but it's, uh, it doesn't hurt for right now. Mm -hmm. Basically like all he has to do is be a positive defensively and the base, his impact completely and radically changes for the exactly like, like 18 million annual was a a little, it was a little rich for him and what he does right now. But if you could shoot 40% on seven or eight threes a game, which he's done in his career, the, the barrier to being valuable is not super high. Um, you just gotta, yeah, you, you just, if you shoot that many threes that well, you don't have to do a lot of other stuff to be a helpful player. And a path to that is be, be something North of an average defender and you're made like, like how many guys in the league get paid being, a 35, 36% three point shooter that you can trust to have on the court defensively and not even be a lockdown guy. Like you, you're making eight figures forever as that kind of guy. And then you nudge that up to 39, 40% three point shooting. And you nudge that up to, Oh, maybe there's a little turnover juice on top of that defense. Um, You know, that's a real path to making some money in this league. So hopefully it keeps up. Mm -hmm. And from like a, a cap perspective, you only have to be in the vicinity of like value because this is all, it's all weighted stuff and it's all metrics. And even though you could find places that say, well, Gary Trent Jr. is a guy who should have gotten a $9 million a year contract and is currently on 18. Like 
Uh, yes, he is very clearly not. He's in the vicinity of OG Ananobi and Fred Van Vliet while very much not being in their vicinity as far as impact. But as you said, like play defense, hit threes, and the offensive limitations, which have been very clear so far, people will look past that because playing good defense and hitting threes at a high clip is that's money in the NBA. And and most importantly is that there is a a radical aspect to his threes. It's not Eric Gordon, like he'll be respected as a shooter, despite coming in at like 32 and 29% for long stretches. But he is a guy who, you know, it won't be show me. It will always be a closeout and stuff like that. And he can sidestep. He can get around. He's not glued to the spot where he catches the ball. And he's shooting poorly right now over the first three games. And he's five of 15. Mm -hmm. Like that's not a two of 15. That's he's a very capable shooter. So, Mm -hmm. and then, yeah, the cap stuff is like, sure. You were, it it did feel like you were negotiating your against yourself a little bit with him in RFA and there's some opportunity costs under the tax and stuff, but like, they're not going to be a cap team. They're not going to be a cap space team next year anyway. And like, there obviously all this stuff has a cost, but the deal's done now. So Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about how you can become, a a useful functional rotation player. And and that's, this is what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And he's done it like, hell yeah, Gary Trent, uh, Dragic, a very funky fit with the rest of the roster. It's been, it's been off kilter. I would say, what are your early thoughts? Yeah. I don't really know where he fits other than like, you need, yeah, (laughs) you need some veteran play and you need some toughness. And, you know, he's a guy who I think, you look now to February, he's a guy I trust to find his role and find his place. Um, He's also the guy that if there's a rotation crunch, once Malachi Flynn comes back to life and Pascal Siakam and Utah come back, I have no issues not playing the 35 year old trade rental. Like obviously you want to keep his value up for a potential deal, but you you're all right. If he, if that role gets minimized, like 16 minutes a game is probably right about where he should be at this point. Um, and it's okay if that gets a little lower, like, Oh, okay. So I just, other than Svi, he's the worst defender in the rotation. And, and he's not like abhorrent because he's tough and smart, but he just like, he can't do the things defensively at the same level that he once did. Um, and then offensively, like he hasn't been a lead guard much over the last couple of years. And he's just like an okay catch and shoot threat. And then you talk about a guy like we're talking about Malachi Flynn, maybe he doesn't fit the identity of that second unit. Well, only there's Goran Dragic. Like it's not, um, it's not as if he's a breakneck transition player at this point. Um, I don't know. He's a weird one for me just because like he is like solid everywhere. And like, again, a guy that smart and that tough and that experience, I, I'm just anticipating him figuring out his place. Um and like you look back at what he did last year and he was still, still really good as mm-hmm. a secondary. So I think he'll get there. I just also, he's the guy that like, I'm not that worried about. Cause if he doesn't get there, he's not like all these other guys have a potential future here. Mm-hmm. He does not. So I'm not as worried about it. Yeah. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed like three minute spurts from Dragic where he makes the offense actually look quite nice in the half court. Cause he's getting to spots that, put the defense out of sorts, but it is just three minutes and he plays like 15, 16 minutes and the rest is super awkward. And you're like, damn, this guy needs to shoot like 45% from three to be positive offensively because mm-hmm. the only thing that's happening is the ball comes out to him and he does his little toe tap. And I guess he'll mm-hmm. shoot when a guy goes under a screen, but there's like a three minute stretch where he'll hit a three, hit a mid range shot and like rotate the defense five times. They say, hell yeah. But after that, he's like, I'm done for the game. I actually, I thought that Nurse might steal the inverted zone from Miami. And I thought he could have some value doing just because of the length, right? Yeah. And I thought he might have some value playing like the the bottom half, the wing of that, like he did in Miami. Maybe we see that happen. But as you say. I mean, did they, I can't remember if Dragic was on the floor for it, but they did mess with that a little bit in preseason. Like I remember a stretch where OG and Scotty were the top of the zone, mm, but I can't remember. I, don't remember that. I can't remember if Dragic was on the floor or not. Mm, I, I do not remember that at all. I have it. I have it annotated somewhere in my notes. So I'll, I'll go back and look. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That, that would be really interesting to see if they do that just because of the, what would the term be? Uh, 
found not foundational whatever there's a term out there yeah. <laughs> some term always svi uh you've not been complimentary of his game yeah. so far and he's been mentioned in and out i actually didn't think he was that bad versus dallas but it, it reminds me of a guy who you know in the preseason was really really great at finding open space for himself reminds me of like a guy who finds spots against engaged defenses versus a guy who finds spots against unengaged defenses. And I think we've seen a lot of the advantages he was able to create working off of other players and particularly in the pick and roll for himself evaporate. Uh, is there anything you've noticed as far as that goes? Yeah. I mean, he's just a guy too, that like, this is, that's kind of the book on him, right? It's like, he's obviously at six foot seven, the way he shoots the ball, you want to find spots for him on the court. And he shot, you know, over 40% on over five threes a game for a whole season, two seasons ago. But he's also like, couldn't stick in rotations or or bounced around a little bit and stuff. So I think that's kind of the book on him is he doesn't, he maybe doesn't have it in him to do that constantly. Um, now, I still think, look, we're talking about a minimum contract player who has even one season of shooting 40% on that many threes. Hey, give them some chances, Th- throw it out there. See what six. I, I certainly don't think it's like, I, I do wonder if he's getting a little bit of the, the CJ miles bench mob year thing. where like, Oh, you're the only guy we have to worry about above the break in the second unit. So we are just going to like, we'll send two to you, even if it doesn't make sense for like, like Svi and CJ miles should not command two guys. But if it means running them off the line and making the rest of that unit play in the half, like below the three point line, you know, it probably makes some sense. So I haven't thought Svee's been like awful. Um, He hits the glass. He's a good, like, you know, he can make the pass attacking a closeout and stuff like that. I just think he's a guy we talk about Gary Trent as a, like the three point shot and where everything else comes in around that. Well, Svee, when the threes are dropping, you can get excited about some of the other stuff, like the the ancillary playmaking and the rebounding and stuff. But if the threes aren't dropping, like he's just not doing enough. And, and I don't want to like, oh, it's a four of 12 stretch. He could never be in the rotation. I just think he's getting a lot of opportunity right now with 49 minutes through three games. And I don't know. I, if this is this is partially like I'd probably be entirely fine with it if Malachi Flynn wasn't on the roster or, or had even got the Delano Banton minutes or whatever. But um, I just, I'd like to see that role bounce around a little bit. You're supposed to be a depth team this year that, that can go a little deeper. Um, I'd like to see someone else get a crack at it for a few games and see what sticks. That's all. He, he reminds me of a player that is like a quintessential uh, Doncic mate or Harden mate or something like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. defenses are overloading elsewhere you let him make reads from the weak side as a cutter or if the ball moves there and as a shooter. And that, just in the loosey-goosey nature of preseason, he looked awesome making those reads. But, yeah, yeah that stuff has been but clamped who do you, down. who is that guy on this team, right, That that's commanding Freddie. Attention. Yeah. Now, now, I will say, the year that he shot so well on such a huge volume for Detroit, like, Andre Drummond was their best player. So maybe he doesn't need that. Um, <laughs> you know, the Drummond, Kennard, Blake Griffin, Derek Rose were like his common starting mates. So maybe he, uh, you know, I don't think Markeith Morris is breaking down defenses that way. So That's maybe the work he can find of Kennard, it. obviously, yeah. more than anything. Uh, Kennard is another weird guy, kind of like Sfee in that way that there will be stretches where you're like, hell yeah, this guy really gets it. But then the rest will be unbelievably yeah. muted. And uh, I will say Kennard has four years of shooting at that level where Savi has one out of three. Yeah. Kennard volume fluctuates, but he has found a way to shoot 40% on threes every year. So, Well, Kennard is good. Like yeah. he's verifiably a positive offensive player who – can provide a bunch of different things, which by the way, even if OG doesn't smack the hell out of his ceiling, this is like, that's a huge benefit to put him in these positions. It just made me think of Jeff green for some reason, like Uh, a guy who's so good making reads as a tertiary guy because of so many strange forced, you know, possessions as the primary. And like, 
if OG just ends up as a guy who's like way overqualified for a role and, you know, seven years down the road is this monstrous player who gets to play next to like this yeah. incredible heliocentric guy. And, yeah. you know, when you put him in like one on two situations or two on one situations, like he always makes the right read because he so had you, you said Jeff Green. I'm my brain goes to Thad Young with this. Both. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. They're, also they're... free Thad Young. Come on. <laughs> What is going on? Listen, the Spurs... it doesn't need to be Toronto, but <laughs> come on, nine minutes so far. What are you doing here? He has to go to the Nets. Like, there's only one way this ends, right? Like, Thad Young goes to the Nets, obviously. I don't know. Does he fit into their trade exception? He makes like 14 million this year. Buyout. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. maybe, right? This is last year. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like maybe, but who knows? Oh, send him to Toronto. He not would that be. There's any not that there's <laughs> any room for a forward, but come on, you just send want him to talk somewhere. Send him somewhere. I, get, wanna... I can watch him all the time, and it's cool. That's literally like. I wonder. Do you have a roster of like Blake pals, like guys that you've just enjoyed like chatting with? Is that mm. something? A spreadsheet. No, not as much. Um, this, especially like the last couple of years, obviously we don't get to do a lot. Um, and I haven't been physically around to talk to road guys and stuff, but there are a couple of guys that I like. I've never talked to Thad though. Oh, seems like a, seems like a Blake guy, not just in play style, but in demeanor. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are some guys that I like. Wainwright NBA. Yeah. Phoenix Suns. Let's Hell go. yeah. Um, good for it. No, I'm trying to think who the, I remember really liking Baysmore. Baysmore was really good to talk to. Larry Nance was awesome. Larry Nance is awesome. He's, yeah. I love um, his game. Corver, excellent to like talk X's and O's with. So I'm trying to think of, of like visiting players, not Raptors, because obviously everyone knows who the good Raptors are to talk to. Mm-hmm. Norm Powell, famously great quote uh, for, yeah. for very many years. Yeah. Uh, what, what have you thought about, this is something we talked about after the draft, but the content creation Raptors, what have you thought about their endeavors in that regard? There's been a ton of fun clips that have come out about the team. Yeah, I thought um, the first Open Gym episode w- was cool. I haven't, um, you know, it, this is one of those things that like, it's it's fun and I'm glad the Raptors skew that's, that way versus being dry or, or not doing it at all. Um, to be completely honest, I'm 35. It has a little <laughs> bit of diminishing returns at some point. Um, yeah, like it's 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 better that it exists than that it doesn't. Um, but yeah, I'm not, you know, the first Scotty Barnes clip hits and then the second one doesn't hit quite as much. And then like the 13th one doesn't hit quite as much and just some diminishing returns. That's all. You're not the Scotty Barnes fan club on Twitter. Like no. one of 27. They keep DMing me. <laughs> I, I actually got DM'd by yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. We'd love you but, to join us. Support yeah. Scott. No, it's um it's uh it's fun. But especially like when they're using the uh they used the other night a Simpsons gif of Homer holding the little leprechaun after they beat the Celtics. I thought that was pretty clever. Baked beans was a hit as well. Oh yeah. Pretty good. Bake them up. I love yeah. beans. Yeah, yeah, the beans guy. It's nice to, yeah, Trey. Shout out to Trey Kirby. Scotty Barnes is uh, he's one of the bean boys now. Hell yeah, three of us so- are gonna go for beans. <laughs> this uh, all star <laughs> weekend this year. Wait, wait, is have you ever been to a bean spot in, in your many travels throughout the years? I don't know if there are spots specifically for beans, but like the mark of a good barbecue place is definitely having good beans. And then this is more U.S. than Canadian, but I love a good bean, a good baked bean with breakfast. Mm, big baked bean boy. Yeah, there you go. The bean uh, boys. Let's go. <laughs> Potpourri. Is there anything else you've thought was interesting about the Raptors this year that uh, you know? Just you, you talk for like four hours every morning for the the weekday. But is there? Well, anything I don't you talk feel? for four hours every morning. JD <laughs> talks for four hours every morning. I, I fill in some gaps. Yeah, right. Are are there any gaps you'd like to fill with me? Uh, I don't know. Like, I I mean, anyone listening to your stuff, I'm sure is aware of this and like has the perspective on it. But like patience is a huge thing this year, right? Like this is 
this is a team I'm sure we'd all love to win 41 games and, and be seventh in the East and have like win the play in and then have a cool, like hosting a play in at Scotia would be cool. And then have a, a fun playoff series or whatever. But like, also that's not really what this year is about. It, it's about all the stuff we talked about with, with getting these guys expanded opportunities and, and figuring out what they are and, you know, let everyone have 10 things on the roll card this year. And then when the team's ready to contend again, maybe that roll card only has five, six, seven, but you know, which five, six, seven they can do and they're better at them. And um, that's all I could, I could just see, I could see it being like a pretty topsy turvy year emotionally. Cause like, I think they're going to have bad stretches. I think they're going to have awesome stretches. Um, you know, come February, March, people start looking at the draft prospects and be like, Ooh, three Canadians in the lottery. Should they, should they, sit everyone down again and stuff. I don't know. I just hope people enjoy the ride. You know, it's, it's, it's weird. Like the Raptors are in the phase that's supposed to be really, really fun as a fan base when you're young and, and all these guys could be anything, even a boat. Mm-hmm. And like, <laughs> but because they got here coming off the title transition out, it's like a little harder to um, appreciate. I think because like, it does feel like an extension of the, we, the North era, but really it's a new, it's kind of the start of something new. So um, I don't know. I'm curious to see how people, uh, how people feel about it and, and how, how it gets on social sometimes, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's, that's one of the, the Raptors by proxy of Kawhi leaving became one of the most interesting after championship teams of all time. Cause even when Dallas won, and they completely fell off the face of the map the next year. Like Dirk was still there. They still had Dirk Nowitzki yeah. and the Raptors like Kawhi, he dipped and like, yeah. hell yeah, Kawhi do your thing. But it, it's really strange for the Raptors to try and do this given the context of the league and what we're used to seeing. And that's, that's, that makes adjustments and like expectations, a very, very weird space, especially like, even, you know, I, I saw a tweet the other day that was saying like, hey, maybe if they would have beat Boston, like they go to the finals. And it's like, yeah, we're still, a lot of people are like, damn, you know, like, is this a championship squad? Are we still in that like area and that kind of stuff? And, you know, you, you have it not so many years ago. You're like, damn, this is what it's supposed to be. But instead you have, you know, like Scotty, like hitting the Quan, that type of stuff, like getting a, a ton of DHO keeper plays that, teams are it seems like it's a pain in the ass for them to guard them on and you got to take the little things like og and uh boogieing on luka Doncic stuff like that but yeah uh people listen to this podcast know this is famously hot takey i am the the last bastion of shock jock radio obviously very uh volatile but uh that feels like a podcast how do you feel yeah it feels like a podcast i gotta i gotta wrap anyway so hell yeah uh the four is yours brother do whatever you want. And oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So for anyone who doesn't know or was wondering where I went, I'm not at the athletic anymore. I'm with Sportsnet. Uh, I'll be doing some writing for Sportsnet.ca, not quite as much as you're used to from me. Uh, maybe some digital stuff too. We'll see. And then I'm co hosting the fan morning show on Sportsnet 590 uh, every Monday to Friday, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. It's available wherever you get podcasts and stuff like that. I'm doing Will Lou's Raptor show on those same platforms uh, every Tuesday, two to three. Uh, I don't know. There'll be other stuff too. I'm tired, Samson. (laughs) And uh, yeah, as Blake said, not as much writing this year. That means that I am the new voice of analysis in the Raptors, as Blake has said elsewhere. You are the tastemaker now. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I've been taste making for a couple of years, not, not on a huge level, but uh, I make a taste on occasion. Sure. Sure. Okay, uh, Blake, thank you so much for lending your time to this. I always appreciate having yeah, you on. Buddy. And this might be the first time we've ever uh, done a podcast where there wasn't a joke at my expense. So is there anything you'd like to get off your chest before we log out? Not at all. Wow. Yeah. Gross. You're, wonder- you're a wonderful guy and a, an even better podcast host. So you just, you have a nice Sunday. Wow. I'm clipping this and straight, straight to Twitter to tweet. Okay. Anyway, okay. And then I'm going to accuse you of having edited my voice. (laughs) Yeah. How did you chop up all those different sentences to make this one? Yeah, and I'll I'll edit the video clip so that it's super jumpy and everything. Yeah. To add validity to your uh, conspiracy, but yes, thank you very much. Uh, 
Blake is fantastic. And the show he's doing is also fantastic. It's cool when people get opportunities to do new things. I suggest anybody who listens to this probably already is, but I can't recommend Blake's work enough, whether it's written on the radio or podcasting, whatever it is. Blake, thank you very much. Listener, thanks for tuning in, whether you got into this in the morning or at night. Have a blessed day and goodbye.